Right, I, I normally don't sit down to give a lecture. I typically stand up, so this is something I'm a little bit unfamiliar with, but I hope you don't mind my conducting a lecture in a seating position. Um, what I'm going to talk about this afternoon is my Macau book, which we can see in front of us, and also something of the voyage of discovery and the journey, shall we say, of writing this book and the charm and delight that Macau has always provided for me, both in the course of visiting there and also in the course of writing it. A little bit on the, the background of this book before I get into the themes that come within it. Um, I suppose it broadly comes within the, the ambit of travel, which is part of the, the theme I understand of this year's book fair. But one of the things which for Macau, for me, is an interesting connection in that it's a place of travel, but it's also somewhere that is to me very, very familiar. I've never lived there, but I have always been a very, very frequent visitor. So for me and for Macau, it's a sort of inside and outside approach to it. it I'm seeing it as a informed outsider would see, but also as someone who goes there so frequently and over such a length of time that I do feel myself to be in some ways more inside. So I'm approaching it from that point of view. Um, but the background on the book itself, it, I jokingly say that this was 25 years reading and six years writing, which is about right, actually. The book itself um, was written in fits and starts in the manner of many books. Um, so it's probably more about two years of actual writing, but it took about six before it, it actually appeared. But the 25 years of reading is actually accurate because the first time I ever went to Macau was 1988. And the place wove a spell for me then, which has never really ever passed. And the wonderful thing with Macau is every time I go there, and I was only there again a week or two ago, there's always something new and something different. I mean, it's like Ptolemy said, said about Africa, there's always something new out of Africa. And of course, it's completely true. There's always something new out of Macau. But without discussing anything much further about this, I must pay tribute as well to the photographers who did the images you're going to see and which did the images within the book. And that's the late Professor Tony Headley, who was the Professor of Community Medicine at Hong Kong University, a most wonderful person, who was a very, very keen and enthusiastic amateur photographer. And he did many of the images contained within this. And likewise, Dr. Colin Day, who was formerly the uh, publisher at Hong Kong University Press. So in the course of researching and writing this book, we had numerous enormously fun weekends over in Macau, walking about with me pointing out to Colin and Tony, that over there, that's what I want a picture of. And they had an unerring eye for picking out exactly what I was hoping to express within my text. But on to Macau itself. Now, Macau is a place where I don't see that the lights have dimmed. We're still in the same bright situation we were a little while ago. May not be, oh, may not be possible. Any, it's too high tech for me too. Anyway, not to worry. If everyone can see, that's the main thing. Now, the cover of this book, to my mind, encapsulated so much of Macau because we had dozens and dozens of images to choose from and I chose that one. And the reason for this is that, to me, sums up much of Macau because you get a Chinese element in it, you get a hint of the European, but most particularly, you've got a moon gate. And this is up at the Tinhao Temple, uh, up at uh, Haksa. And the thing with this particular temple, which I love in particular, is that it's somewhere that the tourists don't go, so it's, of course, always rather quiet, but most particularly, the moon gate gives you a sense of bringing you into another world. So you're coming through this marvellous enclosure. But something else, and that is that, of course, a Tinhao temple is a most unusual thing to find in this part of the world. And I say that because Tinhao is, of course, a Fukin deity, not a Cantonese deity. And this actually came down with the Fukin migration going back five or 600 years ago. So it's very interesting when you then think that Macau, like many other parts of the Delta, was a place where other things came. We look at Macau and we think of it as Europeans coming, other groups coming, but it was also other Chinese ethnic groups coming. So that brings into my mind a number of things. <laughs> 
but going to Macau itself. Now, everyone who goes to Macau takes away something. And for most people, it's the obvious Salsun like that. So, of course, if you go on to Macau and you come back on a ferry on a Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, everyone is carrying a bag of that because you must, of course, have something to go back to the office pantry with the next morning to actually say that you've been. So the peanut brittle and the egg, egg, egg gum rolls and so on like that get brought. But the thing with Macau is the other souvenirs, the souvenirs which are items that sit in your own mind, elements of memory that stay there and never actually leave and pass. So every time I go to Macau, I notice that. But whenever I go to Macau on my own and have a little bit of time to spare, I walk down along the waterfront and give a look up to that because that's the old Bill of Easter, the Fung Geng. And the thing with the Fung Geng is my very first night in Macau in 1988, I stayed there. And these days it's the residence for the Portuguese Consul General and it's therefore off limits to the general public, though I very fortunately managed to get invited there a couple of years ago. And to be honest, I preferred it before because the very first night in Macau that I stayed there, it was still an old hotel. It was very decayed. The walls were mouldy and you turned on the tap and the water came out brown and it was just extraordinary. It was one of those things where you look and thought, why on earth am I so charmed by this? Because everything toward it would make you think, oh, yuck, you know, but it wasn't. And that, to my mind, is summed up so much of Macau in that it beguiles you against your will. That in spite of the things that you first would look and go, why would I like this? Somehow it grows upon you and it continues to do that. So while that's now a very different building, whenever I've got a chance, I walk past and walk along it. And likewise, the waterfront there. Because in the first time I went to Macau, the waterfront was still unimpeded by reclamation further out. And the very first night there, I remember walking down along the waterfront, lights out in the distance and thinking, this is another world altogether. And it spoke to me and it continues to speak to me and has always spoken to me. And the thing with that section of Macau, walking along Avenida de Republica, is if you walk down there and you avert your eye in the right direction, as Tony Headley did with that photograph, you're able to think not a lot has changed. And that's, again, the charm with Macau. If you aim your eye in the right direction, hi, if you aim your eye in the right direction, not a great deal has altered in the past because it's too easy, I think, for people to go there and say, it's all changed, it's all different, it's all modern, it's all wrecked. Well, not all of it. And then further along the, the, the same road, there was this building, which, again, I noted then and then late, latterly came to find out something about. That building there, which is still in a very good state of repair, but now occupied, used to be owned by the Federation of Malaya government. And that was the cadets' mess. And that was where, from the 1930s, 40s, into the 50s, the last of the cadets went up to Macau in 1956. And um, this was where policemen and government administrators went to learn Chinese. Because, of course, in Malaya, they needed Cantonese speakers. They also needed Hokkien speakers. So up until 1948, they went up to Amoy. But up until the mid-50s, they came up to Macau to learn, Chi learn Cantonese. Pre-war, some went to Canton as well. The reason they went to Macau was that they didn't have the social distractions of the British colony. So they're more likely, therefore, to sit down and actually do some work. But that was the building owned by the Federation. And I came upon a poem, which I actually quoted in length in the book, it was written by one of the Malayan cadets called Ger um, uh, Gerald Jolly, who had been a, a language cadet in Macau in 1949-50, and uh, loved the place, as most people did, and wrote this beautiful poem about how much the city had meant to him and how happy he'd been there and how that he hoped that one day he would be able to return again. But of course he didn't because he went back to Malaya and was almost immediately killed in the emergency. And a couple of months ago, I actually went and visited his grave, which I've long wanted to do. And that was in Batagaja, just uh, outside uh, Ipo. So very moving in particular because the poem there of someone who just loved it and wanted to go back and never got the chance. But that's 
the cadets mess, another view of the Tin Hao Temple. This is the, uh, the moon gate that I showed you there before, and you can see there, of course, very clearly. It's an ancient temple dedicated to Tin Hao. It's up, up at Haksa, and it's a very unvisited temple, originally on the waterfront, as Tin Hao temples would be, now quite a way inland due to reclamation. So what I've aimed to cover in my book is it's a social history uh, seen district by district. So you could use it as a guidebook if you wanted to, but I don't recommend it because it's rather heavy to hump about. But you could actually use it to gain an idea for an exploration if you wanted to. What I aim to do with this is to give a social history exploration. So I've started in the north, further beyond the Tinhao Temple, and ended up all the way down to Jokwan, which is out at uh, Kolowan. And that's a particularly lovely view because, again, if you're out at Jokwan, you look at a view like that and not much has changed in all the decades since um, the, the causeway first went in. The other thing I aim to bring in is little fun things that in the course of going around in Macau I encountered and enjoyed and I thought I'll share them with others. And this is one that I particularly like because um, like A, it's been there forever and it's wonderfully old fashioned. Of course, these days, Nostalgia industry has kicked in a lot in Hong Kong, uh, quite a bit in Macau too, and part of the idea with the nostalgia industry is people look back to an imagined past, and particularly when they look at their own present. We certainly see this in Hong Kong today, and people think, oh, it's all not really very good. Um, the, the past must have been better, so people kind of look back to an imagined be better past. But some things are just fun, and like a suit goal is one of them, because with this, the menus have not changed in decades either. So it has banana splits and Hawaiian sunsets and all these kind of interesting things that go back to the day when going out for an ice cream on a date was a fun thing to do. Whereas these days, of course, it would be taken for granted. I've also brought in something of Village Macau. And this I particularly like because that is right in the middle of the city. Now, the charm of Macau is it still has, as indeed Gongjiao still has, its urban villages. So if you know where you're looking, you can see places where that is completely rural South China, but in the middle of the city. So you can see there the distempered walls and some fruit trees and lunch on a chain in the front. I'm joking, no, not lunch on a chain. But if you look at that, you would think that's South China. And that's the other thing which is wonderful with Macau because it is, of course, South China too. And we aimed as well, and Colin and Tony were very good at doing this, of picking out telling details. So that's a detail taken from the building behind. And that's what I've aimed to write with. I've aimed for the general and then get down to the specific and then down to the very specific. And within the general, and the specific, we can pick out details that otherwise one might walk straight past. And this brings us into Macau and its regional role. Because shutters, of course, are a common feature over there. And shutters were, were of course, common in Hong Kong too, if we go back into the 19th century, because they allowed breezeways through. But if we look at these, you can see the material at the top and the bottom. Now, that's capiche. And Capiche is the mother of pearl shell, and that was a major import item from the Philippine Islands up to Macau. And that was brought up for window glazing, because glass, of course, was once quite expensive. So what was used for window glazing also in South China was this, because it would mean you could shut the shutters and there's translucency with the Capiche, so you get some light coming through. So there are a few places in Macau where you can still see this, but I wanted to include that because it brings us in Macau's regional role. Then we get even into the distempering because you can see they're the lovely red colours. Now, of course, when we go to Macau, we see the pastel shades all over. We today tend to think of paint as being decorative, which it is, but it was originally preservative. So the colours which were used reflected the chemical which was incorporated to preserve the material. So we see reds there, and the reds and the pinks which you see in Macau today commonplace on government buildings, that was originally oxblood mixed in with whitewash. And the reason for that is oxblood is iron rich, and if you've got a building with a lot of timber, you need to have something which is an insecticide. So the oxblood, the iron in that, will actually help kill the bugs. In the same way, the yellows that we see over there, 
now, of course, they're chemical distempers, but that was originally sulfur mixed in with whitewash because whitewash will keep away mold, but the sulfur will keep away insects. So the more, uh, uh, the more timber there is in a building, the more sulfur there will be, which is why if you go to Vietnam, for example, which is mainly timber with a bit of plaster on the outside, they're all those ochreous colours. So I just mentioned that one because we today look at Macau and think all these marvellous shades. Well, of course, it was the preservatives. Another of the, is the blues. Occasionally you see blue, and that was indigo mixed in with whitewash. So all of these things link into, into preservative, but also trade, because indigo was a major trade item brought in both from India and from Java. And by the 1820s, the price of production for that had become so cheap that everyone was using blue. The Regency colour was blue. Everyone wore blue in their garments. And likewise, blue started to be used for paint. Then we look at what could be the cliches and the stereotypes. And what I've aimed to do is unpick some of these because everyone who goes to Macau goes and sees St Paul's. Every tour bus rolls up to see this and everyone gets told the same inaccuracy. This is the ruins of the Cathedral of Macau, right? Wrong. That was never the Cathedral of Macau at all. The Cathedral in Macau is where the Cathedral has always been, which is right down in the middle of town. What this was was the chapel for the uh, seminary for the Jesuits, the collegiate seminary for the Jesuits. And the Jesuits had a training mission in Macau exporting priests to Japan. Macau's major role for its first 80 years of existence as of a European settlement was as an entrepot between China and Japan at a time when the Chinese and the Japanese were at the, one of their intermittent periods of not talking to each other. So we look at Macau today, so often people look at these buildings and think, oh, it's a connection between China and Europe. Europe was a long way away. China was largely closed. It was Macau on the coast and its connections with Japan. That leads me back, back down to here because the Jesuits had such success with their proselytization in Japan that they started actually to pose a threat or was seen to pose a threat to the Tokugawa shogunate. And from the 1590s, the Japanese steadily cracked down on the Catholics. And as a result of that, large numbers of them came as refugees to Macau. And the first mothers and fathers of the Makaista, which is the Macanese community, the Creolized community, were actually Japanese. And the Macau dialect, some of the oldest words in it, are Japanese words. So it's very interesting with these connections, but it links me down to here. Because in the first decade of the 17th century, the Tokugawa cracked down even further on the Catholic presence in Japan. More and more refugees came, and they had to have something to do. So the church put them to work, expanding the seminary and doing the stonework. So all of that facade was done by Japanese refugee labor and skilled stonemasons, mainly from the Nagasaki area. So it's very, very interesting when we see those connections because today people are told, are oh, there's the ruins of the cathedral? Well, firstly, it wasn't a cathedral. And secondly, it's a connection to Japan, which is often not brought forward. There on the corner, you can still see the foundation stone for that. And a loose translation of the Latin says, the Holy Virgin Mother, the people of Macau, by their own free will, built this in 1602. It's still there. You can see it's stone and brick, and just behind you can see a fragment of what the seminary church was made out of, and that's rammed earth. Because rammed earth involved making a formwork, two pieces of wood, and putting rubble in the middle, and then pounding it down. So if you actually go up very close and look at the walls, and you look at some of the surviving city walls, there's only a few fragments, they're layered. You can see it's sedimentary because it's pounded in and pounded down and becomes solidified. Then it was plastered on the outside with a material called chunam. And chunam was an introduction from India. And that's a kind of plaster which was made out of um, eggshells, oyster shells, coral lime, all burnt together to make lime plaster, and then mixed up, believe it or not, with egg whites and sugar. So it sounds like a revolting sort of cake icing, but the idea with it is it's plastered with that and then it sets extremely hard. So it, tune them if it's properly applied, you need a diamond drill to get in on it. 
So that was the plaster, which is now, of course, all eroded. But I mention that because if you look, you can still see that sedimentary layer. And I like things like that, and I bring them forth in my book. The idea that you can see something which is an obvious cliché, that is to say, San Paolo, but then you walk just behind it, and there's the foundation stone that no one ever sees, and the construction material that often gets over overlooked. Then we go down into the middle of town, and we can see other buildings which we all see. The Santa Casa, there. Now, the thing with the Santa Casa, this was originally established in Portugal in the 14th century as a means of dealing with the, shall we say, deserving poor. So widows and orphans and others like that, if they ran into hard times, the Santa Casa would look after them. And branches of the Santa Casa were established wherever the Portuguese went overseas. And if you go to Brazil, they actually run the cemeteries there. But the thing with the Santa Casa is it was established as well in Goa and in Malacca and in Macau. And here it became more interesting because you can see there Yunzi Tong at the top. Now the thing with the Yunzi Tong is that this particular organization became fairly analogous to the Donghua in Hong Kong in that it looked after old people, it had schools, it had subsidised accommodation and so on. But the people who got on the committee of the Yanzi Tong, likewise with the, Tong, the um, Tongxin Tong, which is further down on the inner harbour, these represented groups who wanted to have some role in society, same as in the Donghua. So if you wanted to become involved in local society, you get involved with the temple committee, and then the temple committee will say, oh, we need to have someone on Donghua, you can go. And then government will say, ah, oh, that one's quite useful, put him on urban council, and so it went on further. We find that today in terms of political advance. But the thing with that is, if you go in there today, it's still influential in Macau. The people who are on its committee are movers and shakers and fixers and organizers. And at the top floor, there's a little museum, and this links me back down to Macau again, because you can go and visit it. That's Macau's first bishop, Catholic bishop. And you can see the oil portrait of him. But if you note underneath, there's a glass case. Because when he was exhumed, subsequently, in the glass case is his skull and also the crucifix that he was buried with. So you have a very Catholic relic there of someone who was considered an early important figure. But other in early important figures can be seen in the Santa Casa, and in particular is this lady, because her name was Martha Mirup, and that was her, her name in, in, in European languages, but she was originally a Muay Thai. And her story is quite fascinating because she was, in the manner of Macau at that time, passed on from one man to another. So a European merchant would come. They, of course, didn't come with their families or they, they, they certainly didn't get permission to marry until they'd been in the Far East often for 15, 20, 30 years. So they picked up with someone locally. And very often what would be the case is that when someone then moved on to another posting, they would auction off their furniture and sell their horse and other things like that and would say, well, and there's also her in the back room if you want her too. So she'd been passed on from one to another. And the one who eventually ended up with her, a man called Thomas von Mirup, um, formed a genuine relationship with her. He was with the East India Company, and he wasn't supposed to marry, but he did marry her secretly, and he left her all his money. So she went from being a Muay Thai to being the richest woman in Macau. She had her own fleet of ships, and Austin Coates wrote a lovely novel on her life, which was called City of Broken Promises which has been made into a play. And Austin did quite a lot of good research on that, but actually the reason it's such a good historical novel, it was actually Jack Braga that did the research, and Jack Braga gave the material to Austin, who then wrote the book. So you get one who can do research and the other one that can do the writing. But um, it's a lovely story, and that particular oil painting, which now hangs in the, in the, Santa, in the Santa Casa, also forms the frontispiece, frontispiece for City of Broken Promises. If you were to, to read one novel about Macau at that time, I would recommend that one. It's very, very lovely. Then as well in Macau, you get technology. And the first lighthouse on the China coast was at Gia. And that's that one there. And the mechanism was originally whale oil, 
and then it became kerosene and it's now electric light. And the thing with that is it's now a little bit overshadowed by the casinos down below, but if you walk around at Gear Hill at night, you can still see that flashing. And the thing with this is Macau during the war, and I'll come to this a bit later in my talk, was surrounded by the Japanese but not occupied. So it's one of the more interesting things with Macau at that time. But from Hong Kong, you could see the gear light. And the comment that a number of people here at that time said is you could see that flashing in the distance and it provided a, a feeling and an awareness that there was somewhere not far away that wasn't like they were. So it's just a, a sort of symbol of hope, if you will. There are other interesting things one can see up there because there's one of the large bronze bells which was cast in Macau for the Jap Japanese export trade. Because at the time when Macau was established, and obviously they were sending up priests, there was a lot of technological transfer going up from Macau to Japan. So military technology went up, guns were cast in Macau, cannons were cast, and it was interesting, it was the Portuguese that introduced firearms into Japan in a place called Tanegashima, and every 10 years they have a festival there called the Tepo Festival. And it's interesting with this because the Tepo Festival in, in 1991 coincided with the 50th anniversary of the outbreak of the Pacific War. And it also coincided with a, a state visit that Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore was making. And of course, Harry Lee could get away with saying this. He said, of course, the thing with the Tepo Festival, it's a little bit like commemorating giving liqueur chocolates to an alcoholic which is, of course, not a really good thing to say, but never mind, Harry could get away with it. But guns were sent up and church bells were sent up too. And in Macau still you can find some 17th century bells. This one was cast in Macau, wasn't exported, and that is in the grounds at Gear, so you can see it. Then we go into the middle of town and there's the obvious, shall we say, we've got churches, that's San Domingos there, the lovely yellow colour. And the thing with Macau, and this is what I would like to challenge in the next few slides, is that the people who go over as a visitor, and this is a challenge always with a nostalgia view of life, is the past must have been better, mustn't it? Particularly when we see physical evidence like this and say, oh yes, well of course, Life must have been better, life must have been easier, everything must have somehow been better in another world. Well, yes and no. And the physical evidence is there because there we can see the Church of St. Augustine's. Beautiful, lovely. We go inside it, however, and there's a rather different story because this building was rebuilt after a big typhoon in 1874. Much of the heritage structures we see in Macau today are actually post-1874 in their design. And interestingly enough, not really Portuguese architecturally influenced, but influenced from Calcutta. That was the major architectural model for early Hong Kong as well, because Calcutta and Hong Kong are on the same latitude. So if it works there, it works here climatically. But if you go into St. Augustine's, you can see this gravestone. And that is of a young girl called Maria de Moura. Now, as her name would imply, de Moura is of the Moors. Now, Macau was a place for many kinds of refugees in earlier times to come, because the Inquisition in Goa was as foul and as vile as they had in Europe. So, of course, people were burnt at the stake in Goa. It never happened in Macau. And the reason for that is the Chinese wouldn't put up with it reasonably enough. But what was done is that a number of people who'd got away from the inquisitions in Portugal and Spain, and the people that were persecuted were typically Jews or Muslims, had got away from those persecutions, often ended up in Goa, and then in some instances escaped from Goa further east to Malacca and then on to Macau. And it's really interesting with this because the surname de Moura of the Moors implies someone who is of a Muslim convert background because these were forcibly converted. But also other surnames. Maria de Moura, just to give you the story, was a very wealthy little girl. She was nine and she was an orphan, very rich. And there were two young men who fought a duel in order to marry her because obviously you marry the orphan and then you'll have your hands on her money. So two young men fought a duel. One of them, his surname was Coelho. That is interesting because that means rabbit 
And of course, the Jews who were forcibly converted in Spain and Portugal, in order to identify them, were given names of things that they couldn't eat. So you could identify them. So the next time you wanted to have a pogrom on them, you could go after them. Oh, that's the Jews, that's the Muslims. So you give them a name of, of, of an animal they couldn't eat. So coelho, rabbit, lagosta, lobster, ones like this. Lengtol, which is sucking pig. It's, it's revolting, really awful. But the thing with this is it was a, a means of identification. But these two young men fought a duel. Um, in the course of this, Antonio lost his arm so the arm got injured, amputated, pickled and dried. He married her. She then died because she died in childbirth when she was 11. Yeah, yeah. but of course, you know, married under the rights of the church, so that was fine. But um, he then ended up the governor in Timor. And when he died, um, as you can see there, this, well, to, to translate the stone, is Maria de Moura is buried there with her daughter Inez and the right arm of her husband. And uh, he was subsequently buried with her. But I mention this because if you look at that stone, it tells you a very dark story of a place that was very greedy and where people would do absolutely anything for money. And that was what Macau was like. And it, particularly at this time, because Macau was a place of great prosperity from around 1560 up to around 1640. And then after it was closed to the, the Japanese trade, it fell into about a century of great poverty when families who previously had a lot of money were living on past glory. So this particular young man was what was known as a Fidalgo. And the Fidalgo, the term is quite a common one, it means literally a son of a somebody. So it's someone effectively saying, my grandfather was such and such, well, yeah, who are you, kind of thing. But this is what Macau was like at that time, and people were doing anything for money. Likewise, and I touched on the Muizai before. You go into the northern part of Macau, and there's the Canossan Orphanage, and that building is still there, quite a lovely thing. The Canossan nuns came to Macau in the 1870s, and their records, and they took in unwanted children. Their records indicated that between 1871 and 1934, they took in 1,200 boys and 34,000 girls. So you get an idea there of the Chinese attitudes to unwanted female children. Because at that point in time, if you couldn't be sold as a muizai, you would end up on the streets or end up in there. So whenever I look at that building, I think, yes, it's a beautiful building with an incredibly sad story behind it. And then likewise, down on the Inner Harbour, another lovely building, that was one of, one, that was one of the opium go-downs. Now, of course, we tend to think of Hong Kong as having an opium story. Macau did too. And it's interesting that Macau had a legal narcotics trade until 1959. Until 1959, you could go to any chemist shop in Macau and buy one of four grades of heroin over the counter, colour-coded for the illiterate. That was where Macau got its money from. Because when we look today, we think, ah, beautiful pastel painted buildings. It operated on beggary, drugs, slavery was another. Macau was one of the great slaving ports of the Far East. And many of the Chinese migrants who ended up in many parts of the world, particularly Central America, the Caribbean and South America, came from Macau because the Portuguese were still slaving decades after other European powers had given it up. And what was done is that Chinese males, usually males, were tricked down into Macau from their village location. So you get people who are very poor in their villages, were given a story that they will be going down to work in a plantation in Malaya. And then they get down to Macau and find, no, they're actually going to work in a mine in Peru or somewhere like this, and that they would never come back. And these places there, these were the coolie places because they were brought down, tricked, locked in there, and kept in there until they were taken out to be loaded on their ships. This one is called the patio of the coolies, literally as, as the, the courtyard of the, of the, of the, of the coolies. If we were to go up to the fort at Mont, you can see this particular plaque. That's a link to the Africans. 
because Macau had an African garrison until the 1970s. And it's a common feature in many of the guidebooks is having the Angolan and Mozambique soldiers because they were very short, very black, wore red, red fezzes and a sort of flap down the back of their, of their jacket. Something that's now completely vanished from Macau except we still find it in food. Because if you were to go to any of the restaurants there, you find the African chicken. Now, it's not, of course, a Macau food. It was actually Piri Piri, which originally came from Mozambique and was brought in with the garrison in the 50s. Likewise, the main um, um, barracks where the Africans were kept was in the northern part of the city at Mongha. And the barracks is still there. And locally, it's known as Hakwaisan, literally the Black Devil Mountain because it's up on the hill there. But I touch on that because there were all of these other groups which linked into Macau's connections to the Portuguese world. And then we get other connections. This is the Parsi Cemetery. Macau unusually has a Parsi Cemetery, as does Hong Kong and Wampo. But this is one of the more interesting graves. You can see it's in English and it's in Farsi. And it's a very interesting man called Sir Jamsichi Gigi Boy. Sir so JJ, and he was the first ever Indian baronet. And his title is still extant. The seventh baron, Gigi Boy of Bombay, still lives in that city. The title still goes on. He was the Jardine Matheson and Company cotton agent. And he died on one of his business trips to Macau and is buried there. But he was a very, very major benefactor to his home city. And if you were to go to Bombay today, there's a Sir JJ this and a Sir JJ that all over. But it was the Sir Jamsichi Gigi Boy School of Art which employed Rudyard Kipling's father. So there would be no Kipling if there was no Sir JJ. And that, of course, is a connection going back to Macau. Then we get the Macau community itself. This is a stained glass window for the Nalaska de Silva family. And Alaska de Silva has been in Macau for generations. Um, the man who's memorialised in this window owned a series of newspapers. And it was interesting with this, he published newspapers in Portuguese in Hong Kong to circumvent libel laws in Macau. So whenever he had a particular hate on with someone, he'd open up a newspaper in Hong Kong, publish a libel and scold them all out. And then when he worked out his hatred, he'd close down the newspaper. But through the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, there were literally dozens of Portuguese newspapers in Hong Kong that were owned by this man. His sons continued on with their businesses and built a number of houses. And this is one of them. It's called the Casa Branca. And it's now used by the monetary authority. And it's on the lower slopes of the Gear Hill. And there were two sons of the family. They built adjoining houses. This is the Casa Branca next to it. Just behind you can see the yellow building. That's the Villa Allegra or the, the House of Happiness. And uh, that's now used by the Lingnan School. So they've gone out of family ownership, but they're beautiful buildings. And I mention that because if you go around the slopes of Gia, you can still see these houses. And there are a few more there too. And they bring in mind the idea with Macau that these buildings were paid for by the industries I've just discussed. So it's a thing there where Macau was always very, very much a place in the sun for shady people, as Somerset Maugham described of the Riviera. It's very, very true. So we look at these, one must bear in mind what got the money for it. Then we get into other interesting things with Macau in the present day. This little pavilion, which if you're on the corner of um, Rua de Campo, you can see, it's closed up during the day, and if you didn't know any different, you'd think, oh, little kind of Chinese pavilion, that's quite interesting. What it is, is it opens up at night because it's a reading room. And this particular reading room was paid for by Ho Yin, and Ho Yin was one of the leading red capitalists of his day. Um, one of these people who continued to support the mainland right the way through. And of course, it's very interesting that his son ended up the first handover, post handover chief executive in Macau. But Ho Yen was a great, great supporter of the mainland and endowed this reading room. And that contained dozens of Chinese newspapers and periodicals from the mainland, from Taiwan, from Singapore, from Malaya, from other parts of the overseas Chinese world, because it was a place where people could sit 
and read and know what was going on. And this is where Macau was so interesting. It was a liminal place. It was somewhere that was on the edge of a lot of other worlds. So that was very important. And I mention it because if you were to read some of the Cold War accounts, that was a place where people were told, don't go around there because every spy in the place is in and around there because that was where people would go and watch and see what was going on. It's still very interesting at night, and if you go in, they tend to give a bit of a cold shoulder to you. There's still people reading things there. And then we get into Macau into the 50s and 60s. Why did Macau prosper so well? Because it realised who the boss was. And they have always recognised that. The reason that Macau has always survived through centuries of vicissitude is they know who ultimately is in charge. It's a little tiny place, you blow, you blow with the wind. So in the 50s and 60s, they needed to be nice to the communists. In the same way a decade before, they'd needed to be nice to the Japanese. And we can see that because trade organizations became very important. There, you see the older sign is for the guild, but you see above, Kung Wei. Now the thing with the Kung Wei is these became very, very important in the 50s and 60s because these were the workers' associations. And these, this one was for the carpenters, they provided subsidized canteens and scholarships and other things where working people would go. So naturally enough, these particular groups started to get a lot of grassroots support. You wonder why in Hong Kong today, the groups that have got so much grassroots support have come out of the Gaifong and so on. Why was that? Because they actually did things for people around and helped and were useful. So that's the thing just mentioning because you can see there the leftist element starting to come through in Macau in the 50s and 60s. Pawnbroking was another major business there. And with pawnbroking, you needed to have somewhere to store the items. So there are still in Macau pawnbrokers towers. That one's down on the inner harbour. We today think of pawnbroking as being somewhere where you'd go if you ran out of money at the casino. But pawnbrokers were actually short-term credit finance for businesses. And many of the Chinese banks grew out of pawnbroker shops. And not only would people take in gold or jewellery, you'd also take in your winter clothes and your blankets. Because of course, if you didn't have very much money, you'd put them in, they'd clean them, and then if you then got back down to the winter and you couldn't redeem it, well, you'd go cold, wouldn't you? But they took all sorts of things, and these were the places where they were stored. So I mention that because we can see the beginnings of Chinese financing coming from these items. And linked into these businesses, are what people did when they got money, because one of the wealthier businessmen in Macau at this time was someone called Lo Kao, and he had, his son was Lo Lim Yuk, and the Lo family were very involved in pawnbroking, and also were one of the early founders of Dai Heng, which was the precursor to STDM, which was the beginning of the, of the Macau Gambling Consortium. He built a large house in the middle of the city, and when he died, it was left to the Puiching School. And that's still used there. So the Lo family's house was subdivided. That's for the school. The gardens are in front of it still. Then we get Macau as it connects to myth and nation building. Because Sun Yat-sen got around. He was all over the place. And a lot of institutions claim an association with him in spite of them being a bit ten tentative. Hong Kong University, for example, cannot resist saying that Sun Yat-sen was actually one of their graduates. Now, of course, he wasn't. He was a graduate of the College of Medicine, which was the precursor of the Faculty of Medicine at Hong Kong U. So it's not quite the same. And he only came to Hong Kong U once in 1923 when he gave a speech to the Students' Union in which he said everything he learned about being a revolutionary he learned in Hong Kong, where it was the example of sound administration and technological progress and peace and order that made him want to repeat this in his own country. So it's a little bit inconvenient for the modern politically, politically correct. But he also went to Macau, and he worked for a while in the precursor of this hospital, the Kong Wu Hospital. And there's a statue there for him in the, the forecourt there. There's another connection to Sun Yat-sen further up, and this is the villa 
because everywhere in the world that Sun Yat-sen went, there's a Sun Yat-sen memorial house. So there's one in Penang, and there's another one in Singapore, and there's another one in Honolulu. And in some of these, he spent a night, and some of them, he didn't spend a single night at all. And that's one. Because this house, beautiful Moorish place, was actually where he put his first wife when he divorced her. Because he had a wife from whom he had children, but then he picked up with Song Cheng Ling, and Song Cheng Ling was not only much younger and much prettier, she was also much richer. So, of course, he married for money. People don't like to be reminded of that, that sort of the father of the country actually put away his faithful older wife to marry a sort of young, rich girl. But he did. And anyway, Lo Mo Cheng was her name, and she retired to Macau in great dignity and lived in this house until she died in 1951. And if we were to go inside it, you can see there's some portraits of the great man and so forth, but he never went to the house at all, ever. And a little thing with this, I'll tell you this, and the next time you go, you, the power of suggestion is an interesting thing. Whenever I go in there, it's one of the most unhappy buildings I've ever been in. I'm not myself very susceptible to vibes, but occasionally you do pick up a feeling. And in that building, you really get a sense of someone going, get out! It's got a, it doesn't have a good feeling. It really does not have a good feeling in that place. And I felt that before I ever knew any of the history of it, is just feeling, oh, I don't like this place. It doesn't feel good. And it's just an interesting little connection there to Sun Yat-sen. Other buildings, you go out over to Taipei and you can see the government quarters. That's quite lovely. They've been turned into museums. Further up in the north, other buildings that have been transformed. This is the old dairy at Mongha, because Macau had, as Hong Kong did, modern dairying. So that then meant that a European population or a population that wanted to have milk could obtain it free of TB or brucellosis, which were the major scourges. That's been turned into an arts complex today. So artists rent out spaces in very heavily accommodate uh, uh, um, subsidised rates to do their painting or whatever it might be in there. Other connections to Hong Kong come up in the north because this is the manager's quarters, sadly ruined, of the Green Island Cement Company. Because Green Island is, of course, a major Hong Kong company for manu manufacturing cement and for many years had a kiln over in Hong Kong. But their original factory was in Macau. And if you were to look at the Green Island Cement bags that you can see in, in the um, hardware shops, the factory is the factory in Macau, not in Hong Kong. But we look at the architecture in Macau and we see so much of it being Baroque, but what we often don't forget is, or don't notice is that there's a lot of wonderful interwar architecture because Macau in the 20s and 30s and 40s was very prosperous on the back of, an, of a burgeoning gambling trade. So there was a lot of buildings built there in modern deco styles, Bauhaus styles. That one, small one, but it's like the prow of a ship. And that was a very common feature at that time of ships, of buildings designed to look like ocean liners. Small one. And then there's the, the Kwok Tai, which is the hotel down on the inner harbour. That was Macau's second high-rise building, opened in 1939 and is now getting a thorough refit and is going to be fabulous once it's completely refurbished, but you can see they're very, very much of the 30s. And the Alegria Cinema in the northern part of the city, again, very 30s in style. Skyline, this is the house of um, Freddie Gellion, who was the manager of the uh, Macau Electric Company. That's the entrance to his house, and that's the building itself and that's up on the hill at Penna. So there's amazing interwar architecture over there, which often gets forgotten when people only really see the tropical Baroque and the, the yellows and the pinks and the reds and so on. Then there's other connections with Macau, which are quite wonderful. This little church, to my mind, tells us something about changing attitudes, because this is the little Anglican church, Morrison Chapel, in the East India Company Cemetery. Now, that little chapel has a connection to changing gender roles. What do I mean by that? Macau, during the war, was surrounded but not occupied, as I said earlier. And there was a reasonably sized Anglican community in Macau who didn't have a vicar. 
And this was a matter of concern to Ronald Hall, who was the Anglican bishop in Hong Kong. He wasn't interned here. He was actually up in China for much of the war. And he was very concerned about the fact that the Anglican community there didn't have a vicar. Now, they obviously couldn't smuggle in a European male with the blockade. They didn't have a suitable Chinese male to ordain. He looked in the rule book and thought, well, there's nothing in, as I can find about not having a woman so he ordained the first ever female vicar in the Anglican Church, a Chinese lady called Florence Lee. And if you were to go to St Martin's in the Fields in London, there's a memorial to her. She actually kept her licence post-war, though Lambeth Palace said, of course, you don't have women vicars, you can't do that. Um, but she kept on doing what she was doing and has a little footnote in history, therefore. And I mention that because today, with many religious crowds, female clergy is fairly usual. But of course, it all, as with any social change, it starts out with someone progressively minded saying, why not? And of course, the why not was Macau during the war with the Anglican Bishop of Hong Kong. So whenever I see that, I tend to think of life moving forward. And there's a, a portrait of her inside the, the chapel. But then that leads me into some of the connections which bring me on down to Macau itself. This is the East India Cemetery which is a most beautiful place. It's an open air archive, wonderfully restored, beautiful condition. And the restoration of this um, links us in, or links me in, to a story I'm going to connect directly. Because this was in a great state of disrepair by the 1950s, because it was originally very, very much an expatriate cemetery. And by that I don't mean a clumsy way or a clumsy or lazy way of saying white people. I mean expatriate in the classic sense of coming to make a living, not necessarily making a home and going on somewhere else and living elsewhere. So of course the people who were buried in there, family members went, they ended up without anyone to look after the graves. When the cemetery was closed to new burials in the 1850s, it started to decay. And it was only rescued in the 1950s by the Vice-Chancellor of Hong Kong U at that time, Sir Lindsay Ride, and his very energetic second wife, May, who was my friend. And they became very involved in the restoration of this and became very involved in ensuring that it was preserved for future generations. I'm going to talk a little bit more about them and a connection a bit later, but my early interest in Macau was partly sparked by this and also by that friendship. That links me to other things because Macau has always been dependent on water and it has no rivers or no lakes. Artificial means of water supply was created there and the reservoir there was the brainchild of a most remarkable man called uh, uh, Dr. P.J. Lobo, Pedro José Lobo. I'll talk about him in a moment. Um, until he had the idea in the 1920s, he was the government director of economic services then, of building a reservoir Macau could not take off economically because they only had wells and springs. So, of course, if you've got a city without reticulated water, you can't get very far. But when the reservoir was built, it had an intake off the West River. And, of course, it was entirely dependent on Chinese goodwill for the water to come in there. And it's the same thing with Hong Kong today. Where do we get our water from? It's something the naughty children don't quite realise. But if we look at that, we can see the closer integrations with Macau and the mainland, it really goes back to that point in time. But jumping back to Macau and the war, this is when I'm coming back into Pedro Lobo and it'll come back on into the, into the stones. You go into the cathedral in Macau and you can see this. Now that is a prayer offered up to the Virgin of Fatima, the patron of Portugal. And the inscription there says, Queen of the World, Mother of Portugal, help Macau. And that was put up in 1943 during the height of the Pacific War. And it was at this point in time that it seemed possible and indeed likely that the Japanese may have made a feint on Macau. They didn't, but um, there was serious concern that this may have happened and a, a service was held in the cathedral. Now, of course, the Japanese backed off people will choose to believe that it was the Virgin of Fatima actually looking down upon them and helping them, but that's there as a record of the war. Now, Macau during the war was full of refugees, and many of these were supported by the British consul in Macau, who provided a great deal of financial resource. 
The clubs in Macau were all turned into refugee centres. 40% of the government revenue went to support refugees. It was a magnificent time in Macau, and people who were there never forgot it. And I mention this because this is the hockey, hockey pavilion. Now, the area in front has now been paved in, but there was a big hockey pitch right in the middle of town, and that was the clubhouse. And in 1943, there was a charity match raised for the refugees. And the governor of Macau, Gabriel Teixeira, went down for this. And I actually had this value of oral history from someone who heard it. It's quite interesting. Um, there was the Macau team and the refugee team. And someone had put up a subscription to get jerseys for them to wear. So the refugee team all had these matching jerseys with R on the back. R for refugiado. And uh, the governor looked at this and said, um, Poké, what's that? Uh, well, that's, that's the R for refugee, um, Your Excellency. No, 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 no. Um, play was stopped. They had to find other mismatched things to put on, so other shirts and so on. He said, I'm not having anyone wearing these. So they're all taken off. And the phrase, the comment that he used, which I heard from someone who heard it, was, these are not refugees. These are our guests. Now, isn't that nice? But that's very, very much the way Macau was at that time. And private charity did a lot to help it. And one of the most charitable of all was Dr. Lobo. Now, he was very, very wealthy. He was a director of economic services as well as being a government, as well as being a businessman in his own right. And he personally paid for hundreds of people out of his own pocket. He was also a very keen amateur musician and conductor. He used to cut his own records and, um, and inflict them on people who came round to visit him. Here he is conducting his orchestra. Um, Ian Fleming came out to Macau in the early 50s and interviewed a number of people in Hong Kong too. And he interviewed Dr. Lobo, and Lobo inflicted his records upon him. And Fleming went away and wrote a very entertaining description of this. But he also felt that there was probably a bit more to Lobo than he thought and uh, subsequently wrote Goldfinger based upon him, which was very, very unkind. But one of the people that he helped and assisted with was a white Russian family. And George Smirnoff was a white Russian, born in Vladivostok, who trained as an architect in Harbin, and then came down to Qingdao, and was in Qingdao until they were chased out of there by the Japanese in 1938. Then they came down to Hong Kong, and he re-established himself as an architect here and designed the Yacht Club in Causeway Bay, among other things. But the, the thing is, as white Russians, they were stateless and they were therefore nobody's responsibility. And when the American bombing raids intensified in Hong Kong in 1944, their house in Chim Sa Choi was blown out. And they lived for a while in a cave up in the mid-levels and life was very, very difficult. But um, eventually they thought, we'll go over to Macau, at least we won't be getting bombed. So the father and elder daughter went first, and the wife and uh, two younger children went secondarily. And while there, Dr Lobo took him under his wing and said, paint Macau as it looks. So artistic materials are supplied, and he painted a whole series of views of what Macau looked like at that point in time and it's the most wonderful record of what Macau looked like then. I first came, became aware of these paintings when I was working on that book, because May, Lady Ride, before she went to live in England, gave me all her manuscripts of um, the Portuguese stones and statues and memorials in Macau, and I spent two years in the late 90s pulling that together. And in the search for illustrations, I came upon the Smirnoff watercolours. So we used a number of these, and we used one of them for the for the frontispiece. But through the love of the watercolours, I came to know the daughters and came to know more of the story. And this is where they lived, the Pateo de Seis Casas, or the, the, the courtyard of the six houses. It's still there. And this is the house where they lived there. It's still there, but it's in a different condition to now because we've been giving it a bit of public attention and it's starting to be conserved, and there's a high degree of likelihood that something quite good will go in there. But through all of my own interests, I came to know the daughters, and they became very good friends. And when I was working on this book, Irene, the elder daughter, 
very, very kindly wrote a forward for me. And that is Irene over there. And the little blondie in there is the second daughter, and she still lives in Hong Kong, and they're both, they're both personal friends. But I would conclude this by actually reading a little bit of part of Irene's forward. Bear with me. The year and a half that we spent in Macau during World War II was probably the most peaceful and rewarding period of George Smirnoff's sad life. During that period, we had nothing of any material substance, but our family was intact, the people of Macau were wonderful to us, and generously gave all kinds of help and support, and we have food on the table every day. And it's a lovely, lovely account that she describes in there, because the sisters have always been very, very, very fond of Macau, still now. Um, the book fair, for reasons of their own, asked me to provide a, a number of items that I've found inspirational in my own writing. And these paintings have been part of that because I'm very lucky to have three of them, two of them being gifts, originals, um, two of them being gifts from, from Irene. And uh, there are others which I've, uh, prints which they've also displayed too. But I keep one of them in my study and I get a lot of enjoyment and satisfaction from it, particularly because Smirnoff's story was in many ways rather a sad one. It was someone whose life was chased, chased about from pillar to post and pillar to post. And the one that I particularly like is of Junks setting out to sea. And he, he, he was an architect, so much of what he, what he did was buildings or, or still, still, still lives. But the Junks were his way of saying goodbye because he painted this one not long before he died. And it was sort of him setting sail. And that was what he was kind of trying to say in that painting. And that's what I've got on one of the displays outside. I've rattled on probably a little bit longer than I had intended. No one's fallen into a coma, which is also good. Um, if there are any questions, I'm very open to them. And I hope this has been of some interest. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. We have received a very rewarding and informative uh, um, lecture concerning Macau. So you have told so much about the past and present of Macau. Could you throw some light on the future? Because um, the Chinese government is, you, um, is asking Macau to coordinate with those Portuguese-speaking <laughs> nations to act as a bridge between the East and the West. So uh, we will we would like to hear more about that. Well, of course, this is, this is something I don't know a great deal about, but it is something worth bringing in mind, and that is the Portuguese language has now actually got a resurgence in Macau. And the reason for that is that if you go to Brazil, they all speak Portuguese. If you go to Angola, Mozambique, it's all Portuguese speaking. Timor, likewise. So actually where people said, oh, Portuguese, what do you want to learn that for? No use. It's actually very useful. So there's a recognition there, and this is where Macau has, has been in a position to leverage its advantages, sorry, I'm drinking water, leverage its advantages in terms of language, so it acts as a bridge, but also the Macau government and also people in Macau have recognised very shrewdly their relationship to China, and that is, if you do what Ye Ye says, you get lots of toys and lots of sweeties and quite a lot of latitude for naughty behaviour at times. And you also get a lot of advantages. But if you don't do what Ye Ye says, you get a lot of trouble. And of course, this is what Hong Kong has still not quite realised. Um, I, I, a talk I gave on this book when it first came out in 2013, there was a hundred and something people in the audience, a bit different to today, but someone stood up at the back and said, now what did I think was Macau's connection to the mainland and also what lessons could Macau show on Hong Kong? Now bear in mind that this was a talk I gave four years ago. I said, well, in my opinion, Macau today, then, was Hong Kong in five years' time, 
definitely 10 in terms of closer relationship with the mainland. And I was told then, oh, no, of course not. That won't, that won't happen. That's exactly what we're seeing. Did that answer that question? Yeah, um, another question about the gambling industry. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's massively imbalanced, and they're aiming toward having other forms of visitor there and so forth. I couldn't really say with that, but the thing with, with the gambling industry of Macau, just to give a little bit of historical background to it, it's, it, the gambling industry in Macau came about because of Hong Kong. And the reason for that is the Macau government, after and Macau business people, after Hong Kong was established in 1841-42, the business people who were previously in Macau came here. And what people, what Macau government had got prior to that time was rents, rates, charges from being a service centre for foreign businesses. After they'd all left, they needed to find something which will generate government revenue. So from 1848, legalised gambling was brought in really to make up the shortfall of what had been lost to early Hong Kong. And people in Hong Kong went back to Macau because many of them were from, from there originally, so they go there for a holiday. So the tax on vice really started then, but it was through the 19th century very inefficient because it was all in very small individual shareholders. In 1922, the individual shareholders were bundled together into one company, consortium, called Dai Heng. And Dai Heng had a 40-year monopoly on the gambling concession. What they had to do was provide for harbour infrastructure, hotel construction, other infrastructure. So they built a couple of hotels, they dredged the inner harbour, they were behind the building of the reservoir with PJ Lobo I mentioned before. They had that until 1962 when Stanley Ho, Teddy Yip, Henry Fock, their crowd, established uh, STDM. And then they had that for the next 40 years. And then in 2002, it liberalised so with the American operators and so on. But I mention that because it's got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, but gambling has always been the key focus with that. And Macau doesn't produce anything else. The time was when they made firecrackers. Well, that goes into poor areas now. They made garments. China is losing a lot of its garments industry because the wages are going up. They're all going to Vietnam and Burma and Bangladesh. So my guess with that is it will continue in this because they don't actually have anything else. Yeah, but what they have done is that they have been very, very sensible in terms of heritage conservation because the kind of people that go to Macau and enjoy maybe the gambling, they'll also enjoy the churches and the forts and the temples and so on. So people will go again and again and again and again. Whereas the Hong Kong approach to tourism is smash, grab, get them once, rip them off, that's it. Bring them in, steal off them once, up and down the peak, out to the cabbage to get a photograph taken next to it if Joshua Wong isn't putting black cloth on it, whatever it might be, psh, away, and people won't come back again. Whereas Macau, it's been more and more and more. So it's actually rather more sensible and more sustainable. Mm. Other questions? Uh, thank you, Jason, for a very interesting talk. I have two short questions. Uh, one, could you tell us now what the Federation of Malaya building is be currently being used for? And the second question is, you mentioned that uh, the purchase of heroin remained legal in Macau until 1959. Are you sure it was heroin or are, are we talking about f four grades of opium? No. To answer the second question first, it was heroin and morphine, and I refer you to a book by um, Colin, Colin, just blanking on that, it's called Asia's Bright Balconies, in which this is described in depth. So it was um, morphine and heroin, um, not opium, um, though opium could still be purchased, but these were from the pharmacies. And the current use of the building for the Federation uh, the, the Malaysian government doesn't own it. I've ascertained that. It's on a maintenance basis. 
Um, Macau government owns it now, but it, they don't actually use it for anything. So just, it just, in that sense, stands empty. I have been inside it, and it's in a good state of repair, but it's not used for any purpose, because what it was originally used for was a residential mess, so it was just bedrooms and a, you know, a refectory, yeah. Other questions? Right. Um, Uh, have you researched about um, uh, the the Portuguese terms uh, appear in Macau, uh, which for uh, for the decades? That mean uh, uh, the photo you have shown uh, for the Laigue uh, uh, ice cream, uh, it uses the uh, old older Portuguese terms. It's called the uh, uh, yeah. uh, But but for the later Portuguese, uh, it usually use skeletal. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, this is the thing. Uh, over there, you find a lot of older terms used, and it's quite interesting with this. Some of the older terms appear on maps, because if you were to look at the coastal region of the, the, around, the, around the mouth of the Pearl River Delta, the islands appear in English as ladrones, L-A-D-R-O-N-E-S, and that is medieval Portuguese, because the Ilias Ladronas, Ladronas is the robbers, so the islands are the bandits or the sea robbers, pirates in other words. But it's a term which they don't use now in Portugal, but they do use it in Brazil. So it's quite interesting when these languages come, yeah, yeah. Just like uh, similar to uh, Canadian English, which is the old style English mm -hmm. from the European continent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Mm. in Kolowan, near the church out there, near Kolowan village, like Natim's, that kind of square. I have been there and I've seen on the floor a, I can't remember if it's round or square kind of stone. And someone was telling me that it was to do to commemorate a pirate ship yeah, battle. That's right. If you go in front of the church, actually, there's a um, there's an obelisk. And that was a, a battle against pirates in 1910. Yep. And the thing with that, actually, is pirates were a major, major problem around the Delta right through that period, and there was a major resurgence of pirate activity from around 1910, 1912, really right through the 20s. And the reason for that is the Qing Dynasty collapse. The Republican era was very weak, so you didn't have central government control very much around there. Um, and Macau, being that kind of place... Um, pirate bands operated out of there because then they would prey on Hong Kong passenger vessels. And the main reason for this is you had a lot of Southeast Asian Chinese, people who'd gone down to Bangkok, Penang, Singapore, Manila, who were going back to their Hong Ha and they're taking money with them in cash. So they'd be carrying gold, carrying silver, and the word would go out, obviously, through the backdoor networks, that particular vessel has got Mr. Tan from Bangkok who's got how many hundred thousand dollars in gold tails in his, in his suitcase. So the pirate bands would go out. So there was an interesting bit with that. Um, so there's the linkages with them. Um, the issue with piracy is it only really stopped in 1938 and it was the Japanese that put a stop to it overnight because the moment they caught it, anything even looking like a pirate vessel, and burn it. So just put an immediate stop to it like that. But yeah. was that particular stone to commemorate a particular big battle? A particularly big battle, yeah. Okay. That was it, because there'd been one particular band that had been operating behind Okolowan for a couple of years, and they'd finally cracked it against that particular one. So that was a memorial for, we beat that particular band, they're not coming back, yeah. I just have one more question. Um, some of my Portuguese friends had told me growing up that one of the reasons Macau remained not part of Japanese occupation was to do with um, the Brazilian government or emperor at the time who had somehow, this is how it's described to me, got word to Japan that if they invaded Macau that was a Portuguese territory, they would slaughter the Japanese in Brazil. Is that fact or kind of... Oh, that's a, lovely urban, that that's a lovely There's urban no myth. myth. Right. Yeah, but there's a big part of this, and actually the issue with, with Portuguese neutrality, um, the Japanese ignored it in Timor and took over Portuguese Timor because of the advance to Australia. 
So Portuguese neutrality was something which the Japanese kind of left when it suited them. But the main reason for Macau being left alone is it was useful because it was a little tiny place where it was possible for various groups to meet and discuss. So in that sense, it was a sort of Oriental, Casablanca, Tangier, Lisbon, those three in particular, where there was interesting stuff going on. And an example of that is the British consul and the Japanese consul both operated consulates, both operated in Macau at that time, and the Japanese consulate and the British consulate were next door to each other. And through their bodyguards, because Reeves and Fukui knew each other socially, you go out, I'll stay in. So they made a, a kind of point of you're over there, I'm in here. So no, not with that at all. But uh, Brazil did have a very large Japanese settler community because there'd been assisted migration into Brazil from uh, 1908. So if you go to the southern part of Brazil, Sao Paulo in particular, full of Japanese. And they were very involved in vegetable farming and co coffee growing and that kind of thing there. So there's that. But also, Portuguese neutrality, just a thing with this, the Portuguese were selling strategic materials as well. And they were a major supplier of tungsten and manganese and other things required for weapons-grade steel to the um, both sides, but also to the Germans. And they were also a major supplier of uranium from Angola to the Nazis. So it's very, very interesting with this because, of course, the Nazis are very likely to have had the bomb if they'd been nicer to their German Jewish scientists. But they weren't, of course. Um, so the uranium was going up from Angola. The Royal Naval patrols off Freetown in Sierra Leone were huge, and that was all intercepting Portuguese vessels. So there's a big thing with that. But also the Germans were paying the Portuguese for all of their strategic material in gold. And a lot of the gold ended up then being fenced through Macau post-war because Portugal wasn't a signatory to the Bretton Woods Agreement. So it was one of the few places in the world where gold could be bought. And Dr Lobo was one of the big people involved in that. And it was a great business because the Bretton Woods Agreement pegged the international sale of gold at $35 US an ounce. They were selling it in Macau for 70 so you buy at 35, sell at 70, great profit. And it would come out under customs bond to Hong Kong, be loaded onto a seaplane, a Catalina flying boat, which took off and landed. It took seven minutes up and down I had from Sir Roger, up and uh, Sir Roger Lobo is now dead, used to accompany the planes. Seven minutes up and down, land, it will be weighed. The Macau government got 40% of the proceeds. The consortium took the rest and sold it. But the thing with this is much of that gold, of course, had come out of the teeth of people in Auschwitz, like so. So, of course, there's authenticated accounts of gold coming out into Macau in the 50s with the Nazi eagles on it and this kind of thing. Yeah. So it's, it was a big, big thing. And gold was, of course, very important then because as Southeast Asia and the nationalist movements there steadily collapsed and as... Chinese people particularly wanted to put money into gold. Indonesia was big with that, Vietnam another, Malaya a third. They come up to Macau and buy some, take it back down. So of course as Sukarno was destroying the Dutch East Indies and the rupiah was free falling, you found Chinese people would come up and put some money in gold and take it back. Likewise a certain amount ended up on the mainland. And the way it went up on the mainland, this is where people like Fokking Tong were absolutely fantastic because they were using their pre-war smuggling networks that had got things in and out of China during the Japanese occupation. They were smuggling in gold as well. So, of course, a lot... Because China, you've got to bear in mind, from 1950 had a UN embargo. So they had a complete UN embargo on trade. There was no rubber coming in, no petrol oil lubrication, no pharmaceuticals cut off. And, that, and also, Chiang Kai-shek had taken most of the gold reserves and sold them over to Formosa. So building up a gold reserve was done through Macau. So it was very valuable at that point in time. And you can then see why with people like Fock, who was a massive supporter of the mainland all through that time, you then get into the 1980s, the economy liberalises. Oh, you want a port, it's yours. You want this, you can have it. Your grandson likes Olympic divers, anyone you want. All of this kind of thing. So it's very, very interesting when you just look at the support that came through at that time. Yeah, it's, it, Macau was really punching above its weight. Sir? So.
Uh, of course, a lot was coming in via Hong Kong, and one of the people who was a great mover of rubber at that point died yesterday. And that was, um, yes, we know all about that. That's La Wong Fat. Yeah. Um, yeah, he just died yesterday. And, uh, but that's where a lot of rubber was going. A lot of um, oil was going in as well. The other thing with oil, this is where Macau comes in, um, the fishing boats in Hong Kong. The fishing boats in the 50s were going from sail to diesel engines. So they'd tank up with diesel in Hong Kong, chug, 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 chug out of Aberdeen, put up the sails, sail over to Macau, pump it out again, come back into Hong Kong with no fuel in the engines, hold full of fish. Well, we've been out at sea for three days, haven't we? Um, so a lot of kerosene, petrol, oil went in on the fishing boats through Macau. So Macau, as I said, really punched above its weight. And the people who were involved in that were the key red capitalists. So um, Hoi In being one, all of these others. It's, it's really, that period in Macau's history is fascinating. Particularly when we now look at the individuals who just get, get whatever Aye wants to give them, you know. Other questions? So, yes. Thank you, Mr. Worthy, for the very interesting um, talk on Macau. Thank you. Um, I, I understand that you're also a very great historian about Hong Kong. No, thank you. I don't if know about we that. Have, but... <laughs> if you can, could you give us three similarities of the two cities, city in Hong Kong, in the categories of people in place, past and present? And if it is OK, maybe the fourth one, the future. Ah, similarities between Hong Kong and Macau. I tend to see them more in terms of contrast and difference. Um, I don't know that I can even, re it, uh, that is a question that's probably beyond me. Um, what I, in terms of contrast, I would suggest though, Macau is actually genuinely global and always has been. Hong Kong is not. People say with Hong Kong, international, cosmopolitan, all that kind of thing, that's in recent decades and only in a very small amount. Macau was genuinely international going back centuries, and that comes into introductions of food, language, cultural creolizations, racial creolizations. So they're very, very different places in that way. So that's, that's I guess, what I'd be looking at in terms of the, they're very different places. I, I can't think of other points of similarity or confluence. Um, and and to, the, to the future, what did, you, what did you mean by to the future? Is there any similarity that you can project about the two cities? Uh, in terms of their futures, yes. Their futures. Characteristic, anything? Um, as I say, it, it's more, in my mind, it's more differences rather than similarities that I find between the two. Um, but toward the future, I, it's something I pr could probably look in my crystal ball and see, um, is it's more and more connected with the mainland. The only difference is that Macau has actually recognised that earlier, that struggling against the inevitable does not bring them anything. Um, we're starting to recognise that in Hong Kong, but Macau has the head start on it. I'm afraid I don't know that's a very satisfactory answer to you. Um, it's just different point of view, different perspective. I mean, of all the city in the world, I mean, for between Hong Kong and Macau, you don't see a single thing that that kind of put them board alike than the rest of the world, the well, rest of uh, the other cities. Well, I mean, the th the thing is, they're, they're also both Cantonese dominant. So, I mean, that's, that's a point of similarity. So when you recognise that Hong Kong is, a, is ultimately a Chinese society, and Macau ultimately is as well, that's another point of similarity. But, I mean, these, these are sort of, to my mind, very superficial ones, and in that way almost not worth commenting on because they're so obvious. I can't think of anything much beyond that, though. I'm sorry, probably not much use. Oh, it's OK. From my point of view, that China has an eye on both of us. Sorry? China has an eyes on both Hong oh, Kong and Macau. Oh, oh absolutely. <laughs> That's absolutely. a big similarity. But the, the, a key difference with that, though, is that in Macau, and this goes back decades, they recognised 
who was in charge, ultimately. And that was the thing I remember being told by Sir Roger Lobo when we were once talking about the water issue there, because his father was very involved in the negotiations for it. All of the water came off the West River. And I remember the phrase at Sir Roger's was, whether it's nationalists, warlords, bandits, Japanese, communists, you've still got to be nice to them because that's where the water comes from. And it's a similar thing with us here today. 70% comes from, from Hoi Yun. Yeah, anyway. Thank you. Not at all. Any other? Hi, I came to your talk late, so I don't know whether uh, when you did your research, uh, did you um, um, find anything about uh, Patois, like the... Uh, oh, Patois, yeah, the, I've, the I've, dying, in yeah. I've included quite a bit about Patois in my book. And the thing with the, the Macau Patois, the language there is absolutely fascinating because it was sometimes described as um, Cantonese, uh, Portuguese flesh on Cantonese bones. And the thing with that is the Portuguese spoken over there in the Patois was greatly simplified. Obviously, it was a sort of pidgin Portuguese. And it also included Japanese loan words, Malay loan words, Dutch loan words, words from Goa, some English loan words. It's a very, very interesting creole. Um, there were plays produced in it, poems done in it, um, stories and novels written in it. It's largely a dead language. And the reason it became largely a dead language is linked into Hong Kong and rising education because the Portuguese community here, who had very close connections over to Macau, regarded speaking this sort of pidgin language as a little bit, oh, don't, don't be like that. So when they started to learn how to speak proper Portuguese, it was seen as a sort of social marker. So better to speak that. So gradually the, the patois declined into being a bit of a home language and gradually declined even further. The only people that I ever met who could speak it fluently were a number of women and they were in their 90s when I knew them, and that's 20 odd years ago. So there's been a resurgence of academic interest and there's been glossaries done in it, and occasionally there's plays performed in it and so on. The, the, in Macau, they called it the parrot talk. And the reason for that is sort of chapa, 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 like this. And so the accent was rather different. It's been described to me as a similar form of accent to used by Dutch in the old East Indies in the sense that it had a sort of Indonesian inflection to the Dutch. And the idea with it was that, oh, you don't speak like that. You know, if, you, if anyone with an aspiration to being sort of a bit more socially accepted didn't use it. But it's fascinating. It's a very, very interesting language, yeah. So I've, I've included a bit about that in there. Jason, I love your lecture and I have learned a lot from your lecture. Thank you. And I have um, questions about how do you describe the relationship uh, between Macau and the mainland? And how do you describe that? And the, uh, do the Macau people think they are Chinese or not? Ah, well, again, identity issues come through there because one of my pet hatreds is journalists who don't do their research properly describing people from Macau as Macanese. Now, Macanese is the Macaista. That's the creolized community. So you've got Macau Chinese, and then you've got Macanese, and they are a different species altogether. Um, so to refer to the two of them as being the same is a great mistake. Um, Macau has had a very, very large no amount of mainland immigration since the 1970s. And it's very similar in that way to Hong Kong, but in an accelerated form. Um, in Hong Kong today, one in seven people have come from the mainland post-handover or been born post-handover. So one-seventh of the population here today, around a million people, are actually not from an earlier time. Macau, it's more than 60%. And likewise, with the development further around in Zhuhoi, large numbers of people commute back and forth. The border in Macau is more or less academic. In the same way in Hong Kong, you find people are up and down to Samjun, and you could, there are the joint octopus cards which will use both currencies and so forth, whether you're in Hong Kong or in, or in Samjun. That's just the way of the future. 
but in Macau, it's actually been an accelerated process. So you find more and more and more people there just say, well, of course, you know, Macau's part of China, naturally enough, very closely interlinked. And you get a very, very small um, residual European or Macaista community. The reason that they're still there is they're prepared to accept that reality. And if you accept that reality, same as in Hong Kong, no one's throwing you out. No one's making you unwelcome. This is the thing that I, I've, I've always found and, and continue to find. But you, you find that more and more in Macau. No one's making them unwelcome. Another, another key thing in Macau, though, is that Europeans there, less so these days, actually, because it's got more of an expatriated population, but historically, Europeans who settled there all learned Chinese. And the reason is they had to because if you want to do anything around about or go to the market, you needed to manage in the language that everyone else spoke. So very usual to find Portuguese long settled there who will speak you know, reasonable to fluent Chinese, which is, of course, very different to Hong Kong, where you can find Europeans who've lived here for decades and they can't even direct a taxi, which I think is appalling. Um, but yeah. Other questions? If not, well, thank you very much for listening to me. There's a stack of books outside which I'm very happy to sign and I don't want to take them home with me. So um, I hope that they will be meet interest for somebody. Thank you again for listening to me.